now. One. Two. Three. One. Two. Three. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to A Cast for Crows, our Game of Thrones-inspired podcast here on deadscreen.net. Um, today, we're going to break down Season 6, Episode 7, titled The Broken Man. I am Albert Joseph. I'm Drew. I'm Alexa. Oh, I'm Alexa. I'm Drew. <laughs> At least two of us are cool enough to have different names. Hmm. Albert. Albert so, Joseph. Uh... I have a little bit of an issue here. Just a small one. Uh Uh-oh. I feel Mm. like Game of Thrones is getting into this area where that danger's gone. My danger's gone. Uh, I'm a little bit happy because my boy the Hound is back, which is great news. But at the same time, he's back. And then... Our girl Arya had a little run-in today. I got stabbed. But she seems for the moment to be fine. And it's just a little personal issue I have with this where it's like, is that danger even really there anymore? Who have we majorly lost this year? We lost Doran of Dorne. Who gives a shit? But Hold other- the door! Other, uh, yeah. Yeah, we Hodor. lost Hodor. Hod- that was, yes, you're right. Other than that, though, there was a scene earlier this season where Jamie looked to be in big trouble and it turned out nothing, you know? I don't know. I mean, I'm just like. It, it has nothing to do with the story. It's just like the way the showrunners have done things a little bit this season. I feel like a little bit of my worry is, mm-hmm. is gone. Because at first I was like, well, like oh shit, Arya is gone. Like, that's crazy. And then she just popped back up. But, like, okay, so the way the show does it, though, is that, um, episode eight's where we lose people, like, a lot, like, really badly, so we we might still lose people. Right, and I'm not saying I want so many people to die, but it's just, like, every time something, like, earlier this season when Jamie was there, it was like, oh my gosh, are we gonna lose Jamie in this, like, because all the sparrows or whatever came in? It was like, are we going to lose him here? And you didn't really know. And I feel like a little bit of that tension is is slowly dripping away. And it's only Game of Thrones can have this criticism. Because none of the well, other like, shows even get close to making you worry about their main characters. Like, I see for real. what you're saying. Like, this season, to me, so far, has seemed like a season of comebacks. So I see what you're saying. But I think that's kind of like the all-encompassing theme. is like, people are coming back. Right. I got you, and I know this is just an issue that I am having. Like, it's an Andy issue. But yeah. But it's just one of those things, like, it's just a little bit of, I'm not quite worried about. Like, when Bran was running from the the Whites, I was not super worried about Bran. And normally I would have been. But, like, if you do think about it, we've had three people come back this season. We had Jon yeah. Snow. We had yeah. Benjen, and then we had the Hound. Yeah. And, like, That's the season's not it's... even over, so it's... But I think, and I see what you're saying, but I think that's, like, kind of, like, this season's thing. is like, people are coming back, and it's, it's... Yeah, I see what you're saying. Obviously, like, you want the, like, death to be, like, a final thing. Right. Because otherwise it's just kind of like, well, anyone could come back. Right, and I know... And, like, with the Hound, he didn't technically that, die. Yeah, I know it was sort of hinted that the Hound might be coming back. I think Joe sort of said something about it or, or whatever, like, you know. Yeah, I mean, like, I read... We didn't see him die, and so they sort of hinted at that. So that one's not a big deal, but there's just yeah. this vibe this season that's been slightly different. Yeah, anyway. I mean... Yeah, I think it just adds a different element to the show, which can kind of screw with the idea that death is a final like it's like the finality that i mean it's a supernatural show supernatural things are bound to happen right um two two things on this topic one it's important to note that the showrunners themselves have acknowledged that this is very much a season of rebirth yeah as we've seen both physically or literally and metaphorically but also we know what we're building towards and an endgame against the White Walkers, where 
chances are most of the characters are going to die. Mm -hmm. And probably only a couple, if any, will survive. So I think it's important to have at least one season where maybe that fear of losing your main characters or your favorite characters has gone down a little bit because you know that they still have a part to play in the final war. That's just my thought. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I'm not really all that unhappy about it because that means we get more Hound, which I'm super stoked <laughs> about. Mm-hmm. So mm. I need you to tell me what happened because I don't get it. <laughs> well... It was kind of cryptic, but what we do know is the Hound was rescued by a ridiculously named character called Ray, a Septon named Ray in Westeros, unreal. But um, it's he led a group of re- he led a group of <laughs> he led a group of reformed criminals who were trying to do good for the world, and the guy preaches no violence. But I guess it was kind of obvious that they would all get killed at the end because you can't live that sort of pacifist lifestyle in a place like Westeros. But as far as the Hound, um, we know that he was very near death because we saw Arya leave him. And yeah, he was rescued and he seems to... I think he's different because he seems more thoughtful, more aware of his vulnerabilities now. Mm -hmm. than he was before and one thing I wanted to note through that whole episode like we've always called him the hound we just did now on this podcast but that entire episode he was only ever referred to by his first name Sandor and it kind of implies that um, kind of an identity shift like we're ready to see a different version of this man yeah I mean it it started showing in season 4 where he was more sympathetic because honestly he was just kind of like loyal to a fault where he would do whatever needed to be done. And, like, he started to question it later on. And he became a far more sympathetic character. Like, I don't think anyone really cared for the Hound prior to him going on his, like, little journey with Arya. Yeah, I agree. Um, so what the heck is the Brotherhood Without Manners? <laughs> They're called the Brotherhood Without Banners. <laughs> But that was yeah, just our little that, thing. That was, that was just my really bad joke about the Brotherhood Without Banners. They were, oh, if you remember from I, the I, first I, couple of seasons, they were um, Robert Baratheon's men, led by, like, Beric Dondarrion and Thoros of Myr. Yeah, you're saying names. That's not going to help him. No, not at all. Um, Arya, they, so the Brotherhood Without Banners. Arya for a little bit. So is this yeah, the same and, like, remember the hounds, where the guy like, got his, like, this face dude. cut and then it, like, healed? Yeah. It's the same group yes. of, like, wandering randos. Yeah. And I want to talk about that, too, because they're supposed to be people who, like, do good for the world. And they were supposed to be fighting against Lannisters back in the day. But now we just watch them murder a group of completely innocent people with supposedly no purpose. And what I want to know is, are they just a group that's turned into assholes? Or is there something more to this that we're not aware of yet? I have no idea. Well, I can't help. I mean, Alexa, that's your segue. I, yeah, okay, so I kind of had a theory, but, like, in retrospect, I don't know how realistic it is. Um, okay, so I don't want to go into too much detail. Because I don't want to spoil it for people who are watching the show. But we we know that there's a character who is in the books named Lady Stoneheart. And she's basically their leader. Um, and she she's a character who is dead. And she needs to come back to life. And so my thing with it is potentially Ooh. he could be... Or... <laughs> yes. So potentially... Um, I mean, with with the Lord of Light, like, you have to give a life to take a life. So I don't know if potentially having killed all those people would be to bring her to life. But there are other things that kind of refute that. But that's my only reasoning for them potentially, like, for them doing that. I don't see the point of them killing people senselessly. So, I don't know. To me, their only purpose is to bring in Lady Stoneheart, so 
I'm kind of hoping that pans out. That's it. Yeah, they could take that route like they did with the books, or they could take a really lame route and just, like, do what they did with Dorne and just kind of make them bad guys who need to be dealt with. And I mean, I, I really I hope, hope not. I don't go that route, but... Yeah. It You know, with the show, it's possible, that's all. I mean... I just kind of hope Lady Stoneheart comes in, because I've been waiting for this since, like, I think season four is when I found out about Lady Stoneheart, and I was anticipating her to come in at the season four finale, and I remember she didn't come in, and I literally screamed at my TV, okay, screw this, no, and, like, people were like, Alexa, calm down, and I was so mad. But, um, I mean, there seem to be clues that she's coming in. I guess we'll find out. I'm hoping she comes in. I know Andy's not going to like the fact that someone else is coming to life. Boo. But. Bring them all back. Who cares? <laughs> thing is, like. Andy, so, all I think I'll the problem that the show is having. a famous character in the books. Whatever. I think also, like, a problem the show isn't doing a good job of, like, depicting is, like, it's not easy to bring people back. It's not like your, like, average Joe can just bring someone back. So, like, I think that they might not bring her in simply because like it would make it seem really easy to just bring anyone back but it's like it's extremely difficult to do so i mean that's yeah, exactly. what they say <laughs> but they i'm skeptical cuz we the only people who we've seen do it are red priests at this point and there aren't that many of them to begin with So, yeah, I don't know. I'm still skeptical about that, but we'll see. So, moving on, who the heck is this little girl? She's a badass, is what she is. <laughs> she is Liana Mormont, the head of Bear Island, and if you might remember last season, Stannis reached out to her from the wall, and she chose not to pledge her men's support to him. Did, and, um, did we see this, or was she, it over like a letter? It was a letter that Stannis discussed with John. Okay. But um House Mormont is of course that's Jorah's house and Jorah's that little house. Girl, yeah. Yeah. And that little girl is the niece of um Lord Commander Mormont. Okay. From season like one and two or whatever. So she's mm -hmm. in charge. Mm -hmm. And just gives them, like, 62 men. Is that because she had 62 men? Or that was like a, well, whatever. You can have 62 of them. Can't have all of them. Nah, she's a true northerner. I'm pretty sure 62 is the, like, highest number she can give. Okay. I also want to point out that she's a more competent leader than Cersei is, and she's only 10 years old. That's not that hard, though. Yeah, but still, she's ten. It's awesome. Yeah, no, her character is awesome. When she came in, I was like, look at this head bitch in charge. I love that scene, though, because Sansa and Jon both thought they had different routes to get through to her. Jon through his connection with her uncle, and then Sansa as a fellow woman in power. But it turned out they both failed miserably, but it was Davos who ended up getting through to her. As, like, mm -hmm. you know, we've both been thrust into positions of power that we, like, never expected we'd get. And so, like, I get where you're coming from. And it was cool to see that uh, Davos has just had such a good season. And he had another big moment for the North. He really has. He Yeah, Davos has been, been great. He's had a good couple seasons. Uh, Which means he's probably going to die soon. Yeah. <laughs> no, so... don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Sansa and John and Davos are going on this little like, let's go talk to all the northern cities or houses or whatever to try and get them to fight with them. And he's yeah. It we saw him talk to two houses. One said yes. One said no. But mm -hmm. it's hard for me to gauge the overall strength of his army because he has sixty two of the random people, and then however many wildlings, and the wildlings seem to be fighting with everybody, so I, I as a show watcher, don't understand how powerful of an army they actually have. And there was a but little, like, there was a little bit of, like, where Sansa was like, yo, we can't go fight these people. And Jon was like, we have to. And there was a little bit of a rift there. 
but I just don't really know who I want to agree with, because I don't know. Okay, so what I was confused about is it seemed like they had already pledged some of the houses, too. Like, I think she said something like, oh, we have this house, and we have this house. Okay. So, I'm just confused as to whether or not they have them because they think that they're just, like, Stark family, like, Stark supporting families, or if they, like, actually got them. Right. So either Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah. I don't know. Because, like, if you, like, ask them, they probably think the Umbers are on their side, and, like, right now we're not sure if they are. So, in the notes here, you said that they're staying at the same spot where Stannis stayed, and that might hint the fact that they might Davos might find Shireen's burning site, which I did not even think about till I saw that written in here. <laughs> yeah, they noted that um, someone said they were, I think it was Davos who said Stannis had made camp at the exact same spot. And um, Yeah, I think it was him. Yeah, it was interesting that we didn't see Melisandre this episode. Because once Davos, if Davos does find out what happened to her, he's going to know how it happened, and he's going to know whose idea it was. So, you kind of, it kind of brings up the question, like, how will he react? Will he want to kill Melisandre? Will he want to do a Solis and hang himself? You know, she was, like, his only real friend in the world, so... I mean, it's, it, it's a big deal, and I think the fact that they noted that it's the same campsite one season later probably suggests that he's going to find out the truth. Right, because I, I thought yeah. it was a little weird that they said something about, oh, this is the same place where Stan's camped or whatever. I was like, okay, cool, who cares? But <laughs> I think that makes so much more sense now. Yeah. And so I, I would be actually pretty surprised that if that didn't happen. Um, and then I was going to ask you who Sansa was writing to, because I don't know if I missed something or if it, wasn't it was made clear. obvious. Okay. Yeah, we just saw the Stark stamp on that letter. I think the, mm-hmm. the safe bet is that it's Littlefinger because... Yeah, that's what I think. Um, she already knows that he has the Vale's army. But it's possible she could also be riding the Blackfish, who is her uncle, and maybe see if he can... Um, obviously, he's tied up at River Run right now, but if he gets out of that, then he can bring more men up north as well. And so is that the guy we saw in the scene with Bronn and Jamie? Yes. Okay. Yep. So Yeah, I mean, my inclination was immediately to think that she was writing to Littlefinger, kind of like a moment where, like, I need to put my pride aside and realize that his army is going to help us. I didn't think it would be Blackfish, because I figured they were already on their way to Blackfish. Well, that's what I thought it was her uncle, because she had said something in an earlier episode about it, but... Listening to John and her talk, I thought it seemed like John was like, "Listen, that's it. We're just going to move forward with this army." So I thought she was like, "No, my uncle has another one over here, so let's just go talk to him." So that's what I thought, but I am also an idiot, so who knows? Yeah. Uh-huh. Plus, Littlefinger's barely been seen this season, and so we have to make a pretty safe bet that he's going to come back in some yeah. way pretty soon, and. We, he's just basically sitting around with the Vale's army, so, I mean, it was most likely Littlefinger she wrote, but I, just, I was just throwing it out there that could also be the Blackfish. It's so, possible. jumping around a little bit, talking about the Blackfish, could you give me a really brief rundown on what the heck's going on with that castle and why he's there and why some people don't want him to be there? Yes. The main reason is because after the Red Wedding, um, Cersei slash Tommen slash really Cersei declared the River Run castles to belong to the Frey family. And, of course, them being Northerners, you know, it's always belonged to the Tullys. And the Blackfish is um, the oldest remaining Tully in power, and so he wants to take the castle back because it's always belonged to his family. And, of course, he wants to take out all the, as many fries as possible along the way. Fry, fray, whatever. Yeah, see, names are hard. <laughs> so, that scene was really interesting to me. Like, we finally got Braun back because they kept talking about him, but we never got to see him. Yes. And then it was like, they showed this little mm-hmm. ragtag army 
and Jamie and Braun just like walked up like big shots and were like, we're here now. This is sort of our thing. We're, we're going to deal with this. Uh, the guy that almost had his throat slit, had we seen him before? Yeah, he's the one who got that's, married in the room wedding. Oh, uh, I knew. That's, that's, that's Edmure Tully, and for the last time, it's Catelyn's brother. Okay. Because we, ar- we argued about this last week. I yeah. knew we had seen him before, but I couldn't place him. Yeah, his hair wasn't as shaggy back then. Um, so, I don't know, that, it was just interesting that Jamie and Braun, it felt like they were just finally on a new mission, they had a new storyline that was going to be interesting, like, that just felt, in terms of the scenery, and getting those people, in the terms of their direction, it was like a fresh storyline that I was excited about. Yeah, I mean, this whole yeah, season... Yeah, absolutely. You bring, I mean, you bring back Braun, he brings back the much-needed humor that we get in this show and we need it to balance out all the tragedy and shock and whatnot. But it was cool because it was combined with a couple of Northern based characters that we hadn't seen in a while either. So I, I really like the scene and it pretty much follows the book almost to a word, but, um, but yeah, how do you guys think this will end? Because, you know, Jamie's kind of, like, we've always rooted for Jamie ever since around season three or four. Seen when he lost his hand. Guys. Yeah, exactly. But now he's kind of, he's going against Northerners, trying to take them out of their rightful castle. So, you know, who are you guys kind of rooting for here if there has to be a winner or a loser? I'm rooting for Braun. I don't want Jamie <laughs> to die. So, like, I don't necessarily think I'm, I don't know, it's difficult because I like Jamie... But I don't like the phrase, and I don't want them having their castle back. So it's like kind of a double-edged sword here, because I don't want I don't want to lose Jamie, but I don't want Jamie to win either. I think it's clear that Jamie doesn't like the phrase any more than the Tullys do. So it's it's just hard to know if he'll like switch sides or not, because obviously he's going there to do King Tommen's bidding. So kind of hard to say what'll happen. I'm just excited there's a new storyline with some new characters in a relatively new setting and we get some well, stuff. Well, like, in this whole season, we've seen Jamie in this, like, back burner role. And, like, now he's serving a purpose, he's doing something. How long that can last, I don't know. But, like, it's good to see him being productive and not just talking about how he and Cersei are going to run everything and rule everything and nothing gets done. Yes, agreed. Um, so I, like I said, I'm excited about that storyline that I don't care about. <laughs> it's fucking Marjorie in this whole storyline. I'm so over it. I don't even want to talk about it. That's interesting because I actually am a little more invested in it after this episode. Yeah, I so like you, the you weren't impressed by it at all? I mean, I get what you're saying. This, ep- this portion of it was more interesting than the other ones have been, but it's just like, I'm so over it. I just want it to be over. I don't think it's interesting See, anymore. I like that we're seeing like the manipulative side of Marjorie yet again, because again, she's also been one of those characters who hasn't been important in this season at all. She's kind of just like been there. And I think it's interesting like I like that we're seeing these characters come back and serve a purpose again. Because it's very clear that she's not like Team High Sparrow. She's obviously got something in the woodworks. So I like the fact that we're seeing her become powerful and manipulative and kind of psycho all over again. Yeah, it's nice. It's like you said, we haven't seen much of her at all, and so as a result of that, it's impossible to like even speculate or try and figure anything at all out. But at least this episode showed us that she does have a plan, she has a long-term goal, and this partnering up with the High Sparrow is just complete nonsense, and she has something very different in mind. Do we think the High Sparrow is so stupid to not, like, speculate that something's going on in the back of, like, her mind, too? Like, do you think he's aware that she's playing him? Uh, it's hard to say. I think her acting was pretty darn good in this episode. So I think he might, he just might be a bit clueless on that one. Man, if I never had to see the High Sparrow again, it would be too soon. (laughs) 
Go watch Pirates of the Caribbean. He's in there too. He didn't even oh, watch really? Game of Thrones. Yeah, he's yep. he's Elizabeth's uh, dad. Huh. But yeah, anyway, I was I was reasonably happy with that scene. I totally get where you're coming from. It's still not the most interesting by any stretch, but I'm just delighted that there's been some real progression right. with Marjorie. Yeah. I completely agree with you guys that at least something's happening with it now. When they showed her in that same room and they were just like talking the same talk they you know, they all sort of had, I was just like not I didn't want to deal with it. But then, well, I understand where you're coming from, because the High Sparrow storyline is stupid, and I'm done with it, but I liked the way it was depicted. Right. I'm with you. I think we're all on the same page, I'm just, I'm just sick of it. Yeah. Um, and so, Marjorie was telling her grandma to leave, but handed her a note with the rose on it? That's their family's symbol. And that was basically saying, like, yo, I got this. I'm not really this yep. thing. Yep, yeah. that, was her, yeah, she was, that like, was her message to her grandmother that it's all bullshit. Yeah. All right. It'll be interesting to see sort of what comes of this, and hopefully they don't dawdle on it too long. So what do you think is going to happen? What What's the game plan here? That's a mystery. Take out Cersei is probably Marjorie's too. plan. I, I don't know how she, like, we know, we still know a trial by combat's coming. I don't know how she yeah. possibly intends to defeat the mountain, but, yeah, I think her only goal is, <clears throat> excuse me, to free Loras and take down Cersei. There was, hey. go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add, and the High Sparrow. Yeah, please. For Christ's <laughs> sake. So ready to see him go. Um, there was a cool little scene that that you had mentioned in the notes here that Cersei finally admitted her mistakes, and watching that scene, I felt like, what's her name, Lena Hen? Oh, Lena. Yeah, Lena I Heaney. thought she did a really good job because it looked like she was struggling with a lot of that stuff. Like, yeah, like you could tell those words tasted bad in her mouth. Right, like it looked genuine. So mm-hmm. and yeah, something she said finally affected Cersei. Right. Yeah. Like it felt like she really got through to her for the first time. So I just thought that was a that was an interesting scene amongst a storyline that is garbage. <laughs> uh, so the did we know that the Greyjoys were going to Marine, or did we just assume that? Well, they said it, but we had. I mean, we, lear- we prior learned to that. that. Yeah, we, we have been that. assuming because okay. it made the most sense. Okay, that's what I was. They stole out. Euron. They stole Euron's idea. Is what happened. Right. Yeah. Okay. But they're like, but we're not psychos, so we can do it. Right. <laughs> and so they stopped in like Brothel City to hang out. Well, no Brothel City, I think is what it's called. <laughs> that's what it's called. Um. And so you had a note here that said Game of Thrones has its first lesbian main character. But I thought we already knew that about her. Did we not? No. We she... uh, if it is, it's new, it was news to me. Oh. I mean, the internet like exploded over it, so I'm pretty sure it, it's new information. Huh. Worth no- worth noting that she's straight in the books, so they uh, switched her for the show. Hmm. I could have sworn, because when Theon went back at some point. Didn't they have, like, a little interaction or something? Yeah. Not exactly th- brother-sister love. Right. I thought there was something that went on there that hinted or said that that's what she was. I mean, it may have hinted at it. And, I mean, it wasn't surprising to me. Because she's a very, like, masculine energy character. Right. But I don't think it's something that we specifically had been told. Like, I mean, I don't think the internet would have had, like, such a shit show over it if it was something that was, like not new information because i saw like a million articles about how we finally had a lesbian character and all this stuff right so because it's not the first time we've had like lesbian moments on the show but we've never had a character who we cared about who was a lesbian right 
I just didn't. I thought it was a little more common. I was not shocked by it, but maybe that was just because of how they put I mean, that character. I mean, I don't think I was shocked. It, it didn't, like, surprise me. I was just kind of like, hmm, okay. Right. That makes sense. Um, but, yeah. I thought that scene was pretty interesting. Like, the character, or the guy who plays Theon, does something with his face. Like, there's almost a difference between Theon and Reek. Mm-hmm. And, like, the way he looks at stuff. Well, the thing is, like, his face is so anguished and, like, contorted from everything he's been through. He's a completely different character. Right. There, like, you can't... Because Theon was the cockiest little motherfucker who, like, did not care about anyone. And, like, Reek is the, like, soft version of him. It's kind of like a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde thing with him. Right. Like, it's very different. And when... Yara sort of gave him that tough love speech. They had a shot where he looked like Theon again. He didn't look like Reek. Whereas, like, before that, he looked like... You know, it was just, like, the way they shot it and, like, little details in his face or something. So, I thought that whole scene was pretty well done. In terms of what the heck's gonna happen with Theon. Because I... I mean... Something needed to happen to his character. Yeah, I mean, I think he's slowly getting pushed back into being Theon. And that, that I think that tough love was extremely necessary to push him back to who he's supposed to be. It's very clear that he's not completely back. Because he definitely suffered from some horrible PTSD. Right. It, it changed him completely. But, you, I mean, you're right. You're seeing more and more of Theon coming out. Right. And I think Yara is definitely like, a factor in that, because she's kind of reminding him of who he was before he was turned into this, like, pitiful creature. Um, so they're heading off to Marine to show up with their boats to be like, yo, we got some boats. You want to do this together? Is that the gist of it? Yeah. All right. Sounds Pretty like much. Well, the only question is, we know Euron wanted to build a thousand ships, and we know Daenerys needs probably at least that much to take everybody back to Westeros. So, like, I'm, I'm guessing Theon and Yara don't have nearly enough boats for everyone, so it's going to create pretty interesting conflict when Euron does get there, because you imagine they'll get there at around the same time. How so, will they get there around the same time, though? Yeah, I don't know how they'd get there around the same time, because he still needs to build his fleet. He's- how quickly have you guys not boat? seen how characters transport this season? But that, Theon, and Yara, s- Theon and Yara made it from the Iron Islands to freaking Volantis in, like, two episodes. They'll, tran- they'll just they transport have to make Euron a thousand and we'll ships. be expected to not care. How do you build 10,000 ships? Huh. I don't know. He'll find a way. No, I'm not be happy they wouldn't have introduced that. the character if he wasn't going to find a way and get to Marine very quickly. Right, but I'm under the assumption that Yara and Thea- Yara and Theon will get there first and like have yeah. enough time to chat and get some stuff established before. Yeah, I'm in that camp too. I don't think he's going to show up like right away, because logically speaking, making a couple thousand ships. Is gonna take a little while, so it gives them There's a no little trees bit of a head on that start. Either, where the heck are they getting? How are they building the ships? They build driftwood, Andy. Duh. Oh my a gosh! A lot of people have asked forever. That. They're building ships out of driftwood. They haven't even finished one. Anyway, whatever. So, Joe, you're wrong. What is this theory? Nonsense on this here. isn't my theory. This is not my theory. Just, alright, so go ahead and explain yourself, yeah, it's mine. Joe, Albert. Well, the theory goes that um, what you saw with Arya getting stabbed by the waif is not actually what occurred. And my theory is that that was Jack and Hagar wearing an Arya mask. And the, my reasoning is, one... We saw Arya take out Needle last week. She didn't have Needle with her in that scene. Two, that Arya was walking around... Coasting. Kind of, um... Yeah, coasting, and she had her hands behind her back. 
Arya never walks like that, ever. And she was kind of looking out over the canal, just kind of reflecting on her time, and that's never her thing. And let's be honest, if she was acting like that when she spent six seasons, probably when she should be, like, the most paranoid character in the entire show, you're telling me she's just going to stroll around letting her guard down like that when she hasn't escaped Bravos yet? I don't the think so. I've also seen in support of this theory is there's a screenshot from that episode where Arya is, like, kind of walking through the town after she's already been stabbed, and there's a girl who we don't see her face or anything, but she's walking right past her, and she has the exact same outfit that Arya had last season when she was, like pretending to be that, like, oysters and cockles chick. Oysters, clams, and cockles. <laughs> Not again. What a great little song. I totally forgot about that. So, I'm calling bull hockey on your theory. It doesn't make sense <laughs> to me. Also, these theories are never true. <laughs> why would why would it be Jockin? Why? To test T- the wave. But didn't he tell her? Would... To, didn't he tell it's her? A, it, it's either a lesson for the wave, or it could be. Like I don't know exactly, but I mean, come on. If he Arya, if that, if that's she... really Arya, if that's really Arya being all relaxed and getting herself stabbed, she has learned nothing in Bravos, and it makes that entire storyline pointless. It's already pointless, though. But it wouldn't be if that theory is true. Yeah. And come on, it's it's freaking Jack and Hagar. And like, We've honestly, seen this guy do amazing things. And like, but honestly, would... Jack and Hagar didn't... No, 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 but wait. No, no. I'm going to speak here. <laughs> so, Jack and Hagar didn't tell the wave to kill Arya. He didn't just said, he, don't... No, he just said, when she like was like insinuating that she was going to kill Arya, he was like, don't let her suffer. He didn't ever say, yo, go kill Arya. So what the heck does he mean, don't let her suffer? I mean, because it's clear that she wants to kill him, or kill her. But, like, I don't think the waif is exactly what the brother or not the brotherhood, um, the faceless men are supposed to represent either. She is, like, vindictive, and, like, she she's not nobody. I agree with that. She may have once, at one time had the full idea of what they're all about, but it's clear that she's completely lost the religious aspect and she's just jealous of um, yeah. what she perceives as Jacken's kind of favoritism towards Arya, and she's very vindictive now. And I think she's lost her... She's the one who's lost her way, and it's a lesson that Jacken is trying to teach. But why is he getting himself stabbed as a lesson for her? No? I mean, how would how would you do it if you were him? I wouldn't... Would you, I wouldn't would you be, just stab her? I wouldn't just be like, yo, come stab me. I, I just don't get it. Jack, like, Jack has it's a reason also, for everything he does, though. And he never he almost never speaks in literal terms. I think it's also quite clear that Jacken isn't, like, your average human. Like, he has some, like, godliness to him, whether or not he is a god. Or not is still in question. But, I mean, he, he vanishes into thin air. Like, I remember in, like, season two, the last time we had seen him prior to him going in Bravos, or season three, I don't know what season it was. The point being, he vanished into thin air. Like, he's not just a man. I don't think stabbing him is, like, the way he dies. And if it, like, it wouldn't make sense for him to just, like, completely kill himself, in my opinion. So... If it is him, why did they show all those scenes of, like, quote-unquote Arya getting out of the river and then, like, walking through the streets? Like, who's le- who, Who's that a lesson for? I mean, the wave's already gone. She stabbed her and watched her fall into the water and walked away. Pawn bull hockey. Well, I mean, even Jacken needs to recover from a wound. He's, I mean, that's going to take time. What? I just don't get it. I'm just saying, if that was really Arya, and she had let her guard down and had no weapon out, that yeah. makes the entire Bravo storyline pointless, and it's horrible writing. Horrible. 
No, I so think... I'm still I'm still holding on to hope that there's a deeper meaning to all of that. No, I think you're going to be disappointed if I had to guess. Probably. <laughs> I also saw a theory, which I don't know how, how much I believe this theory either, um, that it was Arya, but that she wasn't stabbed, stabbed, that she was helped by Lady Crane, who gave her pig's blood, so it's like fake blood. Because Arya wouldn't just kind of like walk around like mindlessly knowing that there are people after her unless she had a plan. So that's another theory that I've read. That she is making them think that she's dead. I think that's, she just got that's stabbed. Not bad either. No, I think it, she just got stabbed. It's also worth noting that when this first season six trailer came out, Maisie Williams said, You see Arya more times in that trailer than any of you will realize. Meaning what? She puts on more faces? Most likely. Ugh. What's happening? There has to be I a mean, deeper meaning to that. Thing is, like, Arya's not dead. Like, right, it doesn't... She, I don't... Exactly. And that right there is but why thing I is, think Game of Thrones thing is, is walking to a little bit of a bad path. Because if I don't, you probably didn't see it because you never see it. But in the next time on Game of Thrones, we see someone who is diminutive like Arya and looks like Arya, like jump in like fucking Spider Man. Like if she just got stabbed, it's not something easy to do. But I just want people to be stabbed and die if they get stabbed. That's what happens. That's too easy, though. But that's the way the world works. This isn't the real world, yes, Andy. <laughs> but, it's George R. R. Martin's but, world. Ugh, that was such a great part of it. Yeah, your dude's poisoned, he's dead. Your guy gets his head cut off, he's dead. Oh, you get stabbed in the gut five times, you should be dead. She didn't get stabbed in the gut five times. What? Yes, she wasn't she stabbed all that much. She was like slashed. It was only three times, Andy, jeez. It was a slash and then a stabbing mo- motion. But like, I she just kind of got up. Well, that's because you're not a Stark. No. Like, I get where you're coming from, Andy, that you want this stuff to be literal, but just think about the logic, though. If Arya had really let her guard down and is just strolling around and gets herself stabbed, that is horrible well, writing. And, like, then she shouldn't have let what's the point down. of her... Thing is, I'm like, what's the point of her, like, picking up Needle if if she's gonna die? Or if, exactly. like, she's going to be insignificant. Like, it doesn't well, make sense. It's she's obviously... She's not dead. There's something she's there. Get out. Like, she's going to be fine. I have no worries right now that she's going to die. But when she first got stabbed, I was. And that's what I wanted. <laughs> you want the Starks to all die, Andy. You're I, horrible. I just want people to die if they're dead. It kind of goes back not to that dead, danger though. thing we talked about at the start. Mm-hmm. Don't worry. feel you, that you, danger. You, Andy, you do this... You did this last season, and you've do- already done it this season. You keep asking for death, and, like, shocking deaths, and, um, you know, that danger, it's going to come. Man, there's not very and many... Then, and then you're going to regret it. No, there's not many yeah. characters I'd be sad about if we lost. I mean, I was sad that we lost the Hound, but I already got over him. He can... I don't want him to go, but I already... Were you not him sad once. about Hodar? Eh... Hodor wasn't and, one of my favorite characters. But he was just so innocent and good. He did, He right. was too good for this world. But it was that was one of those deaths that I was like, dude went out doing what he should have been. Like, dude went out. He he saved the day. I wasn't sad. He Hodor. It was a hero's but, death. He hodor it up. <laughs> well, Arya I just feel like if Arya were to die there, it would be the most stupid thing. Like, she accomplished nothing. So then, was this, all right, was that part in the books? With Arya? Mm-hmm. Uh, no. All right, so then why even put it in the damn show? Because her There's well, her so much in the, the show the that's book, not so in the books. Happen. Garbage. Get Arya it was, back it was not Arya. something interesting. But that is interesting. If it's not Arya, that is interesting to me. That's how I perceive it. Yeah, but... Thing is, I, w- I think it's important, and I think it's interesting, because right now, 
We're thinking the faceless men are a bunch of shitty, greedy assassins. And if there's a main purpose, if there's like an actual purpose to things, then it puts in a new element that we were hoping for. So shut up, Andy. You're wrong. Shut are up. we gonna get? Are we gonna find out what it is, or is this just gonna be this like convoluted, mysterious thing where he's like, <laughs> "Oh, I just let you stab me to teach you this lesson." She's like, "What lesson?" He's like, "You know the lesson." And then he like floats away like a bunch of butterflies. <laughs> You wow, Andy! You just that's, spoiled that's the ending down of the to show, a tea. Andy. Uh, You've just spoiled the ending for all our listeners. Shame on you. <laughs> You're wrong. Shut up. Let's move on. So, give me a one-minute recap on what happens next week, because I didn't watch it. Uh, Brienne. I, I swore I was going to remember. In the Riverlands. Brienne meets Jamie in the Riverlands. Arya turns into Spider-Man. Uh, I shoot, swore I, I was going to remember, remember <laughs> Okay. I guess I'll just watch it. S- stuff's gonna, I think stuff's we gonna see happen. More of the, I think we see more of the Brotherhood Without Banners next episode. So isn't episode 8 supposed to be our... Generally speaking, it's either episode 8 or episode 9 where shit just hits the fan. Are We, we already one? know it's 9. Okay. All right. I, I won't. I about. won't say anything else. We just know it's episode nine this time. Doesn't it have to be the Battle of Winterfell? <clears throat> Maybe. What the heck else could it be? There's nothing impending. Okay, no, fine. Yes, there it's is. the Battle of Winterfell. <laughs> Unless there's, it's the Sparrow. There's there's more stuff that's impending, Andy. You just don't know enough about it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Whatever. Shit's, shit's going down. It's going to hit the fan very soon. You'll Good. get your li- you'll get your literal deaths. Don't Let's worry. Bring all the shit into the fan. Let's <laughs> knock down the wall and bring the White Walkers over. I still think that's how season six ends, right there. Good. Wall falls. W- White Walkers are coming. Let's bring it on. <laughs> but yeah, shit's going down. All right, I think that wraps up our. Pretty awesome recap of Season 6, Episode 7, The Broken Man. We'll be back next week to break down Episode 8. See you later. (laughs) 